One of my favorite ways to get insights into Victorian era fashion and fiber crafts is by reading magazines from the 1800s. I want to share a glimpse into my Victorian magazine collection, so why don't we all grab maybe a snack, a warm drink, maybe some crafts to work on while I go through some of my collection. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> you joining us. You gotta move that booty off. Oh, there we go. I have a pretty substantial collection of Victorian magazines, so I thought it might be fun to look at some magazines that I have from the month of April, as we are in April right now as I'm making this video. <laughs> Going through my collection, I found two magazines that are from April. We have one from 1883, and we have a bound collection of magazines from 1863 that includes the month of April. So we are going to start with this bound collection. It is Godey's Ladies Book, and it was semi-common at the time, as far as I know, to take a year's worth of magazines that you received and have them bound into a book. The magazines individually would have looked something like this. This is the issue of Godey's Ladies Book from August of 1866. And then you would take these for the entire year and bind them into a book. Godey's Ladies Book is from Philadelphia. And to give a little bit of context on this particular time frame, the United States is in the middle of civil war. In the month of April, the US passed the first wartime conscription act. On a slightly maybe lighter note, we have the invention of the continuous rolling printing press, which allowed for faster production of magazines at the time. With that in mind, why don't we go ahead and start reading through this magazine? So it seems that in April of 1863, the first article is the glance at the London International Exhibition about laces and how they are made, which is absolutely fascinating. And what I find particularly fascinating is that they have the value of some of the sets of lace that are described. So you could say that a point sets, handkerchief, lappet, collar, and sleeves, each set is worth 240 pounds. And we have the fact that there is a flounce Price at a thousand pounds. Next, we have another story. These earlier magazines I have found to be more heavily story based. This is another chapter or set of chapters from a story that was continued in more earlier chapters. So, if we wanted to read the entire basically book or series of stories, we'd have to make sure that we're subscribed, which is, I guess, a good tactic to make sure that people would continue subscribing to your magazine. Then we have some interesting um, novelties for April. So on the top left here, we have a home dress of violet alpaca. Alpaca is my favorite fiber. I enjoy it so much. I find it very soft and very warm. Violet just seems like such a vibrant color. I love the idea. Trimmed with black and white braid. And the corsage is made with plaited jockey at the back. Fancy muslin chemisette and sleeves. I like how the collar also almost looks like a little crown. I know it's not on your head, it's around your neck, but still it looks almost like you're wearing a crown around your neck. And then here on the right, we have a garden hat made of muslin and ribbons. On the right page, we have a few more kind of accessories it almost looks like. So here in figure three, we have a fancy braided zouave jacket. I love the braiding details. I wonder what kind of color they would have recommended for the base of it. It looks very light, but I I wonder if it would have been something other than just white. Figure four here, we have a rich coiffure. I, I, sorry, I don't know how to pronounce it. Made of gold net, wow. With a torsade of black velvet and trimmed with bunches of gold leaves. This seems very fancy. Figure five is an apron for silk or cambric. It very much has those like 1860s style lines to me. It's interesting how you can see just an accessory that I would consider like an overclothing piece still have the kind of 1860s style lines. Then we have a fancy sleeve, suitable for silk or wool. The next section has a little bit more explanation with each illustration. So we have patterns from Madame Demarest's establishment in New York, Broadway. So we have the demi zette is a very stylish variation from the old fashioned leg of mutton sleeve, five leaves forming the upper part and terminating in flat bows below the elbow. The lower part of the sleeve is plain and simply trimmed with five rows of narrow velvet which extend to the wrist. When the material is silk or poplin, the decoration of the sleeve should be black guipure, 
keep your I really struggle with some of these terms I'm so sorry lace one inch in width headed with narrow jet trimming so it seems like it's this one here I love the bows so we have three types of sleeves it looks like and the next one is the medallion sleeve this pretty and novel sleeve is plain at the top and gathered into a band at the wrist its name is taken from the trimming which consists of medallions of material edged on both sides with black lace one of these is placed on the front and the other drowned down the center of the sleeve terminating in a flat bow of silk or velvet and then the last sleeve that we have pictured here this style is something after the model of the old pagoda sleeve the lower part is gathered onto a plain band at the top and over this are placed two deep caps or volants each section of the sleeve is laid over in a fold upon the front the trimming consisting of a silk quilling ornamented with bows of the same shade placed on the upper edge and i also like how they include names in some of these issues for marking it seems like one would hope that you have a common enough name that you could find it in one of these books so Emma if you're out there you can maybe use this as a name for your own marking unfortunately my given name is a little bit uncommon in the United States so I never find anything with my name on it but I could maybe try to piece something together to mark it on my handkerchiefs cloth you name it on the right we go to a necktie of scarlet silks trimmed with black velvet gold beads and black lace a lot of these colors are so rich to me I don't know why but a lot of times when I think into the past or the Victorian era especially the 1860s for some reason my mind goes to a lot more dull or diluted colors rather than saturated tones like a scarlet silk contrasted against black and gold which sounds amazing and then we have a cuff made to match that necktie and I'm just kind of wondering what kind of dress or gown you would wear with this like what color would you wear with a necktie and cuff that's made of scarlet silk and black velvet oh and then I always like hair dressing and pictures of hairstyles and this hair is arranged in two puffs on one side and the other in short frizzed curls so I I think we can see the two puffs on one side. I kind of wish we had another view of the other side so I can see what they mean by short frizzed curls. But I think this looks really beautiful and I love the natural leaves woven in around what looks like the crown. Oh, this is fun. So this is more, I feel like the craft so we just looked through some of the most recent fashions and now we can see some of the arts and crafts kind of that they recommend or that they included. Here we have slippers. It's called the Spitfire slipper and it should be worked with black zephyr with either bead or yellow silk eyes. The ground should be a brilliant scarlet and the filling up a sea green. Wow! That, I feel like those slippers would be stunning. And then a beaded toilet cushion. I've made a toilet cushion myself back then. I didn't really understand what a toilet cushion was. I think I understand that a little bit better now, which is kind of like the toilet is where you got ready in the morning. So what, maybe what we would call a vanity. So this would be the cushion for your vanity seat. The next page has some instructions on how to do netting. First double netting in two colors. And the second one is Grecian netting. Netting is another very interesting craft in my opinion. And it's one that I want to get into in the Regency era, which is a few Few decades before the 1860s netting was very very popular as a way to decorate your outfits so I would like to pick up netting just to have a little bit more variety and diversity in my fabric crafts like I didn't already have enough I feel like I have too many as it is but I always can use more we have a few more patterns laid out here so we can have a letter for a square pillowcase this to me looks like a letter L so if you'd like to have the letter L for use on a square pillowcase here we go or if your name is Louisa you have have an engraving that you can use right here some embroidery designs and a braiding pattern the next bit is re receipts is what they call it we would maybe call them recipes today you can make some potato balls or mushroom stew <laughs> directions on how to make melted butter I feel like today melted butter I just pop a bowl of butter in the microwave and that's how I make melted butter some cakes breakfast cake sounds really good to me the miscellaneous receipts are more for cleaning things so you have to clean silk stockings to make cement for broken china how to make blue ink so it's more like home recipes is what i would think of them as and then we have another section on the editor's table different topics are discussed it's a little bit outdated now so we're just gonna go ahead and skip over that i mean part of the editor's table here is marriages between cousins the question whether such union should be permitted has of late excited much interest basically trying to say please don't marry your cousins especially not your first cousins interesting that that has to be, that that's a point that needs to be made oh and here is also what i thought was very interesting where it says philadelphia agency this is kind of a notice 
to people who sent things in because you'll see some prices listed for some things that are illustrated or talked about here and here they let people know what has happened to those who maybe have ordered something so mrs cdc sent box january 21st mrs ebe sent garibaldi and jacket jah sent crochet jacket by express february 3rd i really wish that I could have that one. I really wanna see what that crochet jacket looks like. And then some answers to some questions. Someone must have asked what a tin wedding is. Apparently it's on the 10th anniversary. Mrs. SAH asked about historical dress, it seems like, and they answered in 1833, the dresses did not reach the ankle by at least four inches. In 1861 and part of 1862, the bonnets were flat on the head. In 1863, they are from four to eight inches above the head. I really wish they would have published the questions that were asked next to these because all we get is from Madge May. The answer to her question is nothing improper in the request. All ladies have to do the same thing. Do what same thing? I, I wonder what she thought might have been improper. And now we have some more fashion plates which are always so interesting to look at. So here on the left we have a dress of green taffetas. Oh, I love green. Well, you know greens and blues are my favorite with designs in white sprinkled over it. A row of black velvet braided with white silk cord is placed on the edge of the dress and carried up one side. The velvet band is edged with black lace. The body is made with revers trimmed to match the skirt. Leghorn bonnet trimmed with buff ribbons and field flowers. Then we have a spring and early summer costume on the right here. It is violet silk dress. Oh, that must be beautiful, that purple. Trimmed with bands of black moire carried up the right side of the dress. The bands are edged with narrow lace, coarse slit, right here, I love those, of black moire, which is merely a band at the back and finishes with two long ends trimmed with lace. Cap of spotted white lace trimmed with two shades of green ribbons. Seems like a purple and green outfit. I'd also be interested on what the undersleeves are like, but I, I don't know enough about the 1860s to really be able to say. And here we have the soutache rope. If I were ever to make anything 1860s, I think I would want to make this. I love the braiding on this. It seems to me like this is kind of a lighter background color with a darker band here. And then on top of that is black braid with some tassels on the top. And look, she's got a pocket. Love the pocket. Oh, we've got some Parisian styles for headdresses. This feels very like spring and summer to me, the inclusion of a lot of flowers and leaves. And we have the description of a new hairstyle with a front and a back view, which I very much appreciate. For this style, your hair is parted very far back, almost to the neck, reserving but a small portion in which to catch the comb. And we have the left page of braiding patterns for slippers, and it just seems like maybe for other trims, and some embroidery patterns on the right. And then we have a pattern for a fancy tidy. It looks kind of like a fox chasing two chicks or ducks near a pond. So it is to be netted and figures darned in. And I believe when you have a background of netting and you darn in the spaces, that's called filet. And filet crochet is meant to imitate filet lace. And filet lace is where you darn spaces in netting. And it'd be kind of neat to do the original filet lace by first learning how to do the netting, and then after you make the netting, you then fill in the spaces with darning. It's a lot, but I, I tend to take on big projects sometimes, maybe bigger than I have the time or energy for, but we'll see. Hopefully at some point I'll, I'll learn how to do the netting myself. And I hope that you enjoyed this little foray into the 1860s. And next we are going to jump ahead into April of 1883. Now why don't we jump ahead 20 years time to April of 1883. We just received the new copy of The Delineator, which is published by the Butterick Publishing Co. And yes, it is exactly the same company that does the Butterick sewing pattern still today. And to give you a little bit of context around the time that this would have been received, this is just about a year after the first season of The Gilded Age. That show, if you watch it, takes place. So we could be Marion receiving this magazine in New York City. Another thing that happened in April of 1883 in the United States is that a bill was passed to protect the lands around the Niagara Falls. All right, why don't we go ahead and give this magazine a read? Volume 21. 
So we have some tips or the prevailing and incoming fashions for ladies in walking costumes. We maintain the daintiness and convenience of length. <laughs> Let's take a look at some of the plates that are in this magazine. This one's in a little bit rough condition, so I'll try to be a little gentle with it. I really like figure number one on the left here, the ladies promenade toilette or toilet. I love that richly designed fabric with the flower patterns all over it. I would love to find a modern fabric that recreates that well. On the right, it looks like the ladies breakfast toilet, which is close to kind of the wrapper ensemble with the morning corset that I made, I feel like. And then we have another promenade toilet, which has this wonderful coat. I mean, do you think all those buttons actually function as buttons? Because if so, I feel like that would take an eternity and a half to button up this entire coat. I feel like by the time I buttoned up the coat, I would just not want to take the walk anymore. I would not want to promenade anymore at all. Here we have a ladies house toilet and it looks, the scarf to me looks particularly interesting. Maybe because it's recently Easter, but for whatever reason, I feel like those are Easter eggs <laughs> all over her shawl and scarf. And this is unique, these kind of long scallops. I don't think I've ever seen anything like that before. Another ladies costume on the right with the bustle. And then we have a few, this almost looks like watered silk is going to be my guess. And I like that they have both the front and back views. You can also order all of these. So that's what all these numbers are for. So if you wanted to at the time, Butterick would publish these as sewing patterns. You could look through this magazine and send off to get the pattern sent back to you. It seems also like the sizes that are available for the patterns are for ladies 28 to 46 inches of bust measure, just to give you an idea of how large of a size range the sewing patterns were available for at the time. We have an apron and a chemise and here's some overskirts, some more overskirts with kind of, this is now an elongated pointed scallop. The 1880s is something I haven't really ever worked in as well so it's another one that I would like to try out but I just haven't had the chance or time to. Oh that's really interesting. So here it's talking about dress materials. It says nobody who can remember 25 years ago can doubt the great increase of wealth and consequent development of luxurious habits. Habits. I'm sure they mean a particular class of person, but it's interesting because 25 years ago is almost exactly the time frame of the Godies ladies magazine that we were looking at. So they're kind of referencing almost that generation when talking about this particular time frame and how much the wealth has increased. Of course, we get to my favorite part of all of these magazines, which is the craft section specifically this is fiber crafts and here we have a set of instructions on first how to crochet and then once you know how to crochet this chain stitch it shows you how to do a star stitch which is useful for a variety of things shopping bags afghans scarfs fascinators. If you stick around to the end, I'm actually going to go ahead and break out some of my yarn and try this stitch out. So you can maybe see some of these patterns come to life. We have a spray of forget-me-nots and cross stitch. I think that looks really beautiful. And a whole bunch of little knickknacks that someone could make. A decorated crumb tray or a scrap. I thought this was a slipper at first, but it's a scrap bag. We have a fan wall pocket. You can even decorate your lamp shades yourself. And now we move on to the advertisements, which I always find a particularly interesting section because I feel like it lends itself not just to curated articles or fashions but more to what people are interested in based on what you're being advertised. So we have silks, uh, it looks like for fabrics makes sense. This is a pattern magazine. So if you want to shop for your fabric here, you can get some. In the bottom right, the Hercules supporting corset, which is an improved abdominal corset and is so constructed as to give natural and permanent support to the abdomen. I feel like you can really see kind of the curves of the 1880s coming through. What do we have next? The American Dictionary. You can get a free watch as a part of it. And then a little bit more of advertisements for it seems like delineated style magazines and instructions and that is April 1883 reading the delineator why don't we go ahead and grab some yarn and see if we can try out that crochet star stitch I grab my crochet hook and a few balls of yarn. We have Andean Treasure. It's one of my favorite yarns because it is made from baby alpaca. Did I mention that I love alpaca? I think I mentioned it about three or four times already. <laughs> All right, let's go to the instructions. We have the pictures on this page, but the written instructions on another page. We start by making a chain of stitches of however long we want the garment to be. 17, 18, 19, 20. Oh, and in case you're wondering, I have a 5.5 millimeter crochet hook. We have to take up the next five stitches. One, 
two, three, four, five. And then we go over and through all of them. Then one more chain. I'm gonna keep going to the end of the row. And then I'm gonna read the instructions again on how you do the second row because there are separate instructions on how to do the second row. And it seems like you're actually breaking the yarn and joining it in again, which is interesting. I usually go back and forth. I don't break the yarn when I'm knitting or crocheting unless I'm maybe changing colors. And we have a row of this dusty pink done. It's just so poofy and cute. Okay, so the second row, fasten the thread by making a chain stitch, breaking the thread and pulling the end tightly through the loop. Draw the thread through the first loop of the star stitch first made. Make three chain stitches and take up the stitches A, B, C, D, and E. So why don't I work the second row in this ivory color? And we have finished the star stitch example. I have to say, I really like how this stitch looks and I can see why they have you restart every row by breaking off the yarn at first. I also really like these colors together. I, I hadn't bought them to go together, but I really enjoyed them. How exciting is that? Some fiber crafts from an 1883 magazine. I hope that you enjoyed joining me, kind of going over some magazines from the 1860s and the 1880s from the month of April. I have another of a collection that I can do one every month if you're interested and if so please do let me know. It won't always be the 1860s and the 1880s, it depends on my collection. Sometimes I'll have the 1920s, sometimes I'll have the 1890s, it just depends on what is available and some months I'll have a lot more than others. Thank you again so much for joining me. If you like anything to do with fiber crafts, especially historical and antique fiber crafts, knitting, crocheting, tatting, <laughs> weaving, please feel free to subscribe and I will see you all again very, very soon. Bye. <laughs>